So we have just now completed the season, Feast of Tabernacles, the fall festival season. And now we're leading up into the longest period of time between now and Passover that there is no holy day you know, observance. But we are leading up to uh, a very familiar day with all of you, especially here in the United States. Those of you in Canada and other places, uh, the U.S., of course, Thanksgiving Day is coming up soon. We're less than one month away from, from that. Those two times of the year have some things in common in the sense that they're both times of giving thanks. They're times of being grateful. And you know, I think in retrospect, all of us would greatly benefit from in our own lives realizing, accepting, and being thankful for who we are and for what we have. Too many people today spend more time worrying about who they're not and what they don't have as opposed to being thankful for who we are and what we do have. It's a big step really in one sense of the word to learn how to live our lives with gratitude, to learn how to live our lives and not worry about the things that we don't have, but to be happy with what we do have. Now that's not to in any way take away, you know, endeavor on our part to improve our part in life and everything else, but not to become so wrapped up in it that we're constantly chasing, as they say, the Joneses. I have never met the Joneses to know how to, you know, how to catch up with them, but that's what the saying goes, you know, to keep up with the Joneses. Grateful people learn how to look up and see blessings and not cursings. They see opportunities and not bad luck. Grateful people also look up and see God as God. And there is a big difference between the two. In Psalms chapter 33 and verse 8, and I have all of the scriptures, much to the chagrin of some of you in my notes, and so I'll get to them quicker before you will. So in one sense of the word, it might be well if you want to just to make a note of them and not try to turn to all of them because I'm going to be going through some of these scriptures just with a little bit pretty quick. But in Psalms 33 and verse 8, it says, Let all the earth fear. And I think most of us know and understand that that word, when it's used in this particular kind of a context, means it would be closer related to learn how to revere, how to love in that sense of the word, the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand, what? In awe of him. Let all the earth fear him. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Does that describe you? Do we fear God and do we stand in awe of Him? Do you sometimes even possibly feel overwhelmed that the God of the universe desires you and me and everyone else, basically, but that He desires you personally? We see over in the scripture over in John chapter, I mean Job chapter 14 and verse 15. It says, you shall call and I will answer you. And you will have a desire to the work of your hands. That word that is translated desire would better be rendered jealous. You, you've heard somebody talking about pining after somebody or pining after something. It, it would more closely resemble using that type of a word. It also might come closer to being saying he is greedy in that sense of the word and not wanting to share you. He wants you so much. And we know in John chapter 3 and verse 16 that he loved us so much that he was willing to give his only begotten son. That expresses a love that the only person who's come close to in my life that I know of is the biblical example of Abraham, of what he had to go through. But he was willing to give of his only begotten son. There's another scripture that I think in context with this, that if we can say this, we've come a long way. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 38, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, what is going to come between us in this? According to this, if we can say, 
I am persuaded that all of these things, nothing is going to separate me from the love of God. There's nothing that can happen in my life that is going to separate me. But yet every one of us in this room could give testimony to someone we probably personally know who has allowed something to come between them and God. I don't know who you're thinking about. I have names of several people in my mind that I have, have talked to about that. You know, we live in a world, unfortunately in one sense of the word, that has lost all sense of true reverence for God. It's disappeared. We live in a nation that for the most part has largely lost and is daily losing more and more. You see it on television, you read it in the newspapers, daily losing more and more of its sense of awe and veneration for God. It becomes worse by the day. Um, I talked to someone this past uh, feast, and I, they may hear this message. If they do, they'll understand why I'm saying this, who had talked with me about their son, who I have known for many, many years, who had married a girl whose family was atheistic. And it's been very difficult on the family in going into that kind of a situation where the rest of the entire family basically are members of the Church of God. And he was too at one time. But it has been a drawing. And it, it's, it's reflective of the society that we live in, the times that we live in, the things that are happening. It seems like today most everything is measured by how does this that I'm going to do affect me? We leave God out of the equation. It's not, you know, what would God want me to do? There used to be a movement years ago. We used to even have it use me at summer camp. Uh, I've gotten the, the, the initials, the abbreviations. What would God do? What would Jesus do? Um, WG, what would they be? WG, WWJD. I can't get the initials there together. But we had the kids. We gave them bracelets and things like that for it. And, you know, it, it stop, maybe stops us in our tracks sometimes before we do something, before we say something. What would, what would Jesus do? in this kind of a circumstance or situation. But when we, we're, lived, we're living in a world, in a society, a nation, in the civilization around us where there is no awe of God, there is no fear of God, there is no veneration of Him, it makes it much more difficult. We're trying not only to overcome ourselves, but to overcome the society and the world that we live in. It's, it makes it more and more difficult, and it's not getting better. It's getting worse by the day. We also live in a culture, in a world, of narcissist and if you don't believe me you know just look around you real close because they're everywhere we see them on television we see them in high political offices and everything else as the old saying goes they're everywhere and it, it's it's something that again reflects what is going on in this world around us even many who call themselves Christians refer to God in such terms as Big Daddy, or the man upstairs. And you name it, you've probably heard several more that people use in reference to God. And there's no reverence there. There's no awe, there's no love, there's no respect. It's more or less an acknowledgement that there may or may not be some form of a higher being. One theologian that I read several, it's been months ago now, maybe even a year ago, call God, or he was talking about him in the way society looked at him, as being Mac Deity or the Big Mac. Now, of course, that's a playoff on McDonald's and all that goes with that, and you know, it's such a worldwide known name within the food industry. But calling God Mac Deity or the Big Mac. Too often he is painted, God is painted as a very nice, comfortable, old, doddering grandfather making him seem weak making him seem less far less than who he really is but those of us who profess Christianity those of us who call ourselves Christians we must look to God on his own terms but you know it, it's really easy even on our part if we're not careful to unconsciously trivialize the holy and to at the same time then perceive God as somewhat of an extension of ourselves. We think if we're a Republican that God's a Republican, as it were. If I'm a Democrat, God must be a Democrat. 
we too often unconsciously assume in one sense of the word, he is whatever we are, but yet bigger and better. And I, I don't think anybody consciously does that, but we do it sometimes by our actions, by our words, the things that we say, the things that we do, and the things that we carry on in our lives and allow it to happen. We think that possibly he shares our biases, our little quirks, our opinions. I don't mean to burst anybody's bubbles, but that's not true. Hopefully we share his, but not him sharing ours. Some even try to take scripture and fit God into their box. And you've heard people do that about how God thinks about things, alluding to God thinking the way that they want you to think, the way that they think. And so we take a scripture totally out of context and try to put God into this box that we've built. It's similar to what sometimes people do in prayer. When we go to God in prayer, we've already built a box. The answer is in the box. But when the answer is outside of the box, we think God has not answered our prayer. God answers every prayer. Just sometimes the answer is no, or not now, or it's wait, or you need to learn a few more things before I answer that prayer. Now, I don't mean to, to in any way paint God as a harsh in that sense of the word, because he's not. Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he will do whatever it takes, whatever it takes in our lives individually, not just my life, and he doesn't lump us all into one big old piece of coal. We're individuals, and he knows what's best for us in our life. That's the reason we should pray, not my will, but thy will be done. Because God does know best. There used to be a program on TV called Father Knows Best. Well, that was a little bit of a play maybe even on that. Because God does know best. We may not think so. And there are times where I know you have and I have, have fought against God. In the sense of we don't accept the situation. We don't accept the answer as it were. But I can look back now after about 50 years and definitely see where God has taken me down some avenues that I would not have gone down on my own. I would not have made that turn at that intersection. I would have gone in a different direction. But he thankfully pulled me a different way. And here we are today. As I say, we try to, in putting God into that box, we want God to come in to, in effect, our dimension, to something that we're comfortable with. But Scripture tells us that God is eternal. He is immeasurable. He is multidimensional. And I think, and, and I think Scripture bears this out, he is beyond finite description. By that I mean God is infinite. You and I think finitely. We define everything within the text or, or the context of what we know, what we can understand. So therefore there is no way that we can truly understand God because he, because he is infinite. We can't describe him in that sense of the word. We can take what we read in the, in the scriptures and what we can do as a human being and do our best, but we, we don't reach God in that sense of the word because he is beyond that comprehension in the, in the ultimate description of that. I think we're all going to have a, a big surprise. In Ezekiel chapter 1, in verse 1, there is a scripture that says, Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. And then Ezekiel went on to describe in the next few verses as best he could the four living creatures. And then skipping down to verse 25, he said, And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne and had the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness. And keep, notice the word he's using here, the likeness. He can't really describe it completely, but he says that this is the only thing I can use to describe it. It was like this like the likeness of the appearance of a man upon, above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, 
and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. Now, you know, I feel sorry for Ezekiel in one sense of the word. He's trying to describe what he is seeing in vision, and he can't do it because his words are finite, and what he's seeing, as it were, is a vision of the infinite. Now, I hope that everybody understands what I'm saying when I say that. It's difficult to describe something when you don't have the words, the vocabulary, the understanding to really describe what you're seeing. You do the best that you can. I've had situations like that similar where I didn't really fully understand what I was looking at to be able to describe it, not in the same way as this. Verse 28, As the appearance of the bow, of the rainbow, that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. As the song says, I can only imagine what Ezekiel saw. I'm not sure I want to see that in one sense of the word in that same way that Ezekiel did. I would imagine it scared the bee willies out of him. It would me. But you know, for us, for right now, God is visually inaccessible. He reveals himself to, through his word. We have a visual picture. And don't start thinking about all these pictures that you've seen since childhood on the walls of churches and, and Sunday school classes and other places. I, I'm afraid to disappoint you, but that ain't him. And I think you already knew that. I'm preaching to the choir in one sense of the word. But you know, the smallest hint of his magnificence, even the tiniest shadow of the reflection of his glory, should be in each of us a cause for tremendous awe. But yet, with gratitude and with thanksgiving for what he has given to us, for what he has revealed to us. In November of 2003, you may not remember it, but we had one of the most dramatic meteor showers that has been seen in centuries. It was not as visible here as, it was, as, as, as well as it was in other areas of the country. But I understand in those areas where it was clearly seen, it was almost unbelievable in its brightness and in its glory. But you know, that even that pales into mundane. It pales into just ordinary insignificance when compared with the glory of God, the beauty of God, and the majesty of God. Isaiah tried to describe it also in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5 when he said, Woe is me! For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This is what happens when we as humans get even what we see as a visionary glimpse of the Holy God. Things that are described in the Word of God. Although Isaiah was in vision, he was in awe, and he was awestruck by the majesty, by the grandeur, by the magnificence of God. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 29, it says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Come before Him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Do we worship God? Do we ever think about that in the beauty of holiness? Psalms chapter 29 and verse 2 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord again in the beauty of holiness. There was a lady, her name is Ellen Vaughn. She wrote a book several years ago called Radical Gratitude. In the book, she describes a man by the name of Marty Jinko. I think his first name was actually Lawrence, but he went by Marty. He was a Catholic priest. Most of you, have any of you ever heard, of the, heard the name? He's famous because of the fact that he was held by terrorists in the Middle East for 564 days. During that period of time, almost exclusively, he was blindfolded and handcuffed and in shackles. I can't imagine going one day like that, but to go 564 days in that condition. The part that Ellen Vaughn describes in her book concerning him was that one night his guards came into his cell pulled him from the cell 
took him up on the roof of the building and they ripped off his blindfold and unshackled him. He, he said he knew the end was now. They were just, you know, he, he was waiting for the bullet to come that was going to take his life. But unbelievably, the guards told him that they knew that he had not even seen light, much less the moon, in a long, long time. And they wanted him to see it because it was so brilliant, so beautiful. So even they had a certain level of appreciation you know, for the beauty of the moon. But he, he just knew. He said, I knew it was over with. I knew as soon as it was. But he said, as he, they took the blindfold off of him, he said he just looked at it and it was so brilliant, so beautiful. He knew that God's love love reigned invisibly in his own words he said he thought how beautiful this is and how beautiful god was and how much he had to be thankful for now i don't know what period of time that this happened was at the beginning the end or the middle of his captivity but having been there for more than one day and yet he was thanking god for how much he had and quietly he said thank you lord for everything um can we, like a person like Marty Jinko, in the face of unbelievable adversity, still see the beauty of God, the grandeur, the mercy that he has, and then not be completely overwhelmed by the love that he has for each of us? How can we not be grateful? How can we not be thankful? In Psalms chapter 96, in verse 1, it says, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord and bless His name. Show forth His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the heathen, His wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. O worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Fear before him all the earth. You know, there's one constant in life. That constant is change. Now that contradicts each other in one sense of the word. But there's one constant in our life and that's change. There'll be changes in our circumstances, changes in our relationships, changes in our roles in society, and of course death comes to us all. But the other constant, and there is another constant, is God. Because God is present through all of them. He's there for, for us from the beginning until the end. He's not going away. He doesn't change. The scriptures tell us He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do we keep that in mind when we're going through difficult times? That God desires us. He wants us as a work of His hand. He's going to do whatever's necessary to bring us to that point in life. You know, I think all of us have heard of show and tell. If you had a kid in grammar school, you know what show and tell is. If you haven't, maybe you don't know. But it's a program where they bring something to school and they, they show it and then they tell all about it. <clears throat> you and I are now living in a time of show and tell within our lives. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. So how do you and I, how do we go about showing our gratefulness and our thanksgiving to God? Well, one way is the Bible speaks to us in many places of encouraging others as well as ourselves as, you know, with God. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, Exhort one another daily. Exhorting each other, encouraging each other, you know, helping each other wherever we can. So, so as we go on through life, how do we just celebrate and show our gratefulness and our thanksgiving for the beauty of God's holiness as we encourage one another? Keep that in mind as we see others that are in difficult circumstances, difficult situations, need our prayer. 
um, met several people, not met them in the sense of new at the feast this year, but seen them for the first time in several years and was not aware of some of the difficulties they were going through in their lives. Um, put a new emphasis, you might say, in my prayer life. Uh, some of the prayers, some of the problems that they were having and have been having. And as we see things like that, you know, how do we try to encourage them, to lift them up and encourage them as well? As I mentioned earlier, we're, we're in a show-and-tell time in our, in our lives. And I don't think there's any greater example of how we can show our gratitude and our thanks to God, as it says in Matthew 28, in verse 19. It says, To go you therefore and teach all nations. Now, you say, how am I going to teach all nations? Good question. We have a work here at the Church of God International. Almost every religious organization that you're a part of has some type of an outreach program where we're trying to teach other people. We're trying to bring them to an understanding by presenting the message of God to them. That's a way that we can do a part of it. Every one of us have come up in our lives with different circumstances, situations, opportunities to where we had a chance to talk to someone about God. Have we run from that opportunity or have we immersed ourselves in it? Have we witnessed to them before God? And I don't mean going out and you know, knocking on the door and somebody opens the door and say, hey, do you know God? Have you accepted Jesus Christ? Most of you, if that happens to you, what are you going to do? You're going to close the door because you don't want whatever they are coming to you, and that's what will happen to you too if you do that more than likely. Although, uh, I heard of one person who did that, and they said that, and he asked them in, and then he started opening the Bible and showing them what the Bible said as opposed to what they were trying to bring into his home. So I mean, maybe you want to do that sometime. That they might not, it might keep the people off your doorstep after that. They don't want to come back you know, to be heard. They want, they, they want to be heard, not to be told. So maybe you can do that. But it says to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. You know, God promises that as we show our thanks and our gratitude by telling others about Him, that He will always be with us. He will guide us. The scriptures promise that he will give us the words when we need the words in order to help other people, in order to witness for him. But you know, one of the best ways we can show our gratitude and show our thanks is through our prayers. There's an old hymn that is titled, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It's always been a favorite of mine, and I'm not going to read the whole song, but I want to read verse 1. It says, O soul, are you weary and troubled? There's no light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Boy, that's a message. We get so wrapped up in, so worked up over this life in this world when we need to be looking and that's one of the things that the Feast of Tabernacles pictures is that we're not a part of this world we're pilgrims on a pilgrimage through this world our goal our home is a better place is another place and that's where we want to go but prayer provides us the privilege of talking to God at the same time of listening to God too often we go to God for all that we need and want and we pray a lot that way, but we don't always listen to God. It's a time to give thanks and a time to show gratitude for all that we have been blessed with. I think most of us are familiar with the story of the very first Thanksgiving that was held in 1621, as the best history books can come up with it. But did you know that that Thanksgiving celebration lasted for three days? They were there to celebrate and show gratitude and thanks to God, not only for the bountiful harvest, but to worship him without fear of persecution because that's the reason many of them were there. But you know, it was not until 1863, 242 years later, that President Lincoln gave the proclamation establishing it as a day to recognize God as the provider of all of our blessings. He began his speech by saying, and I'm just going to read the prelude to it, the year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful years and healthful skies. 
to these bounties which we are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come. Wow. Does that describe this world today? Others have been added which are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to but to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of an almighty God. I'm going to read that again. Ever watchful providence of the almighty God. You know, that speech today could have gotten a politician impeached. At very least, ACLU and their ilk would have come rushing in. Every newscast, except for maybe one or two, would be you know, screaming for his resignation, his impeachment, and everything else. If you don't believe it, just read the story of the five pastors down in Houston who, by the openly homosexual mayor and her staff, sent out requests for, under guise of law, copies of their sermons. Now, it's not going to go through. A judge is going to, has or will throw it out. But, you know, it's coming, folks. It's all about us. We live in a world that things like this can happen and are going to happen, and I think we're only seeing the beginning. As we go through this season of Thanksgiving, what is it that we should thank God for? Well, the answer to most of us, <clears throat> to a believing and a grateful Christian, is anything and everything because that's where our source is from. We thank Him for our family. We thank Him for our friends, our church, for the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear, the roof over our heads, and every other blessing of life. But most of all, we thank Him for the most wonderful gift of all, that of His Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that salvation is not something we can earn, but it's something to give us freely by God. And you're all familiar with the scripture, so I'm not, I'm not reading a brand new scripture to anybody. But in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ. God chose you. He chose me. He redeemed us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He forgives our sins and He gives unto us of His Holy Spirit. Beyond these gifts, which are immeasurable, our life is blessed with a purpose as we seek each and every day to try to live our lives in order to please Him, to serve Him, and to fulfill His will in our life. We have His Word to guide us, to comfort us in a time of trouble. We have the blessings of His abiding presence. And I can't emphasize that too much, His constant abiding presence. Whatever your Feast of Tabernacles was and whatever your Thanksgiving is coming to be, what it may include, the noise and the clamor of family or friends. Uh, we have always been blessed with the fact that all of our family has been able to go to the feast and we rent a big house and everybody's there together. And, you know, it's sort of tedious at times. Not, not really. And you have everybody there running all over the place and different families and different wants and everything. But we missed two this year due to external circumstances we couldn't control. So we had two missing. And I, and I missed them. And I think we all did. It just like not having you know, part of the family there. But we certainly are blessed in that regard and thankful for that. Or if your feast and your Thanksgiving will be a quiet, peaceful day or somewhere in between, we are overwhelmingly blessed. And we have all of this because we have life in Jesus Christ. In Psalms 103, beginning in verse 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, who heals our diseases, who redeems our life from destruction, who crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies our mouth with good things, 
so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is merciful. He is gracious. He is slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto his children's children. To such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them, the Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens. Bless the Lord. You know, these blessings from God are not just a few isolated acts to individuals. They are a continuum that has continued since time began. Only our indifference or our ignorance can quiet a very continual song from each of us of thanksgiving. So as we go through this time of season, be grateful. Always bless His holy name and celebrate the beauty of His holiness.